My name is Jay Ponteri, and I teach in the English Literature and Writing Department. And I want to thank everybody for coming. What a great turnout we have. And I know I can see that there's a handful of people that this is maybe their first uh, Merrill Hurst Reading Series event. And so that's very special. Thanks for coming to our campus and, and uh, for being here in this great, in this great theater. I'm going to um, admittedly read a, a more of a lengthier introduction than I, I would. Um, it's going to last about two hours, um, so I hope that's not a problem. Um, no, I, I am reading a little lengthier introduction. I interviewed David um, Shields, our guest writer, um, and that interview is going to be in Tin House um, in the summer issue. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge that Van... Wheeler contributed to that interview. Um, uh, and um, I thought it would be kind of um, appropriate to read the introduction to the interview. Um, so without further ado, um, the interview is called True to How I Am in the World. David Shields published his first book of nonfiction, Remote Reflections on Life in the Shadow of Celebrity, this book. It's an amazing book. Uh, I recommend it. Since then, six nonfiction books later, Shields has helped to reconfigure the essay form by enlarging its capacity to discover while shedding its more antiquated properties. His prose eschews transitions and conceit while retaining an ever-deepening insight and mystery. You never know where it might go. It goes wherever it needs to, which is something you said in a lecture. It comprises not only argument and memoir, but reportage, confession, philosophical inquiry, imaginative stance, literary and cultural criticism, rant, documentary motif, motifs like snapshots, portraits, media images, and list making. His prose is achingly self-reflexive, a voice speaking, listening to its own timber, then responding. Shields' work accumulates not through dramatic instance, but through theme, through the ruminant experience of sustained meditation. His most recent book, Reality Hunger, a Manifesto, is an ars poetica for a burgeoning and disparate group of artists who, living in an unbearably artificial world, are breaking ever larger chunks of reality into their work. The themes Shields explores, the bending of form and genre, the lure and blur of the real, play out constantly around us. And reality hunger is a rigorous, radical reframing of how we might think about this truthiness about literary license, quotation, and appropriation in television, film, performance art, rap, graffiti, and lyric essays and prose poems and collage novels. Reality hunger, hunger explores and defines the ways in which reality-based art has bloomed in, our last, in the last several decades while showing how our once rigid cultural understanding of reality and fiction as two mutually exclusive concepts has begun to disintegrate. Other books include The Thing About Life Is That One Day You'll Be Dead, a New York Times bestseller, Black Planet, Facing Race During an NBA Season, a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, which is just an amazing book on race, uh, Enough About You, Notes Towards the New Autobiography, and then a novel, Dead Languages, and a linked collection of stories, or a novel and stories, Handbook for Drowning. Shields has received a Guggenheim Fellowship, two NEA Fellowships, an Ingram Merrill Foundation Award, a Ludwig Vogelstein Foundation Grant, and a New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship. He lives with his wife and daughter in Seattle, where he is a professor in the English department at the University of Washington. 
For going on 10 years, David and I have been having what appears to be a single conversation, a continuous conversation. And it began in a lecture hall in Asheville, North Carolina. And it continued in car rides and on walks in Portland, over tea, and today in the art gym. So it's a real honor for me uh, to, to have David here. So let's please welcome him. Thanks, Jada. That's wonderful. Thank you. So thanks, Jay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for those generous, thoughtful words from Jay. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, as Jay said, um, talk about the book rather than read from it. You're all capable of reading it, if, if you like. And I'll simply talk about it, how I came to write it, what some of its main strategies are, what some of its main points are, and then I'll try to leave us time to take some questions. What, I wonder what time I should, should finish up around quarter after eight, something like that? Yeah, Somewhere in there? Uh, Don't know if, what time. Uh, so. Okay, so, great. So, um, the first thing I thought I'd talk a little bit about is how I came to write the book. As a kid, I, I grew up with a, a fairly bad stuttering problem. I still have, have glimpses of it now. You'll probably hear echoes of it here and there. But as a kid, I had a, a tremendous tr um, trouble speaking, and I had a, a severe stutter. And um, I was like this little six-year-old deconstructionist, you know, that I, I, I all of, of language was sort of self-canceling reverb to me, that I was, was very aware of language always communicating only itself. And um, that, to a certain degree, was in conflict with the idea of my parents. My parents were both journalists. I, I grew up in L.A. and San Francisco. And they believed in... I would call it a kind of transcribable reality, that somehow the reality was out there and could be transcribed via transparent language. And I, to a certain degree, these two versions of language and reality were in conflict from a very early age. And in a way, they've continued to be in conflict. And in a strange sense, reality hunger is the staging, in many ways, of these two different takes on language and reality. Yes, the book is called Reality Hunger, but I would argue the book is sort of, the reality is in quadruple quotation marks. I, I believe in reality, I believe in having a hunger for reality, but I also am extraordinarily skeptical that we can get to anything like reality. So anyway, I just sort of wanted to throw in a little bit of biographical data and suggest how much um, in a way, it's a kind of a complicated staging of these early dramas of childhood in a strange way. What does that produce in me? In a strange way, my parents' view and my view as a stutterer, it produces an idea for me that nonfiction isn't true. Nonfiction is a, 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 a framing device to, to foreground contemplation to foreground contemplation. That to me, memory is a dream machine. That composition is a fiction-making operation. That so much of the attempt of this book is to try to rescue nonfiction as art, try to rescue it from both memoir and journalism. That a lot of the book was born with my frustration with how nonfiction gets talked about in contemporary literary discourse that every book gets subject to what I call trial by Google. That you know, every book gets treated as if it were an article in the New York Times. And so much of my impulse is to try to show you, or myself and the reader, that from the beginning of time, nonfiction has been a much contested territory. There's always been an incredibly 
gray, blurry boundary between fiction and nonfiction. For instance, one of the first works of Western history, uh, of literature in West, of history in Western literature, is Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. In that book, Thucydides makes up the general speeches. I just find that unbelievably interesting that, you know, in a way, James Fry had, had nothing on Thucydides. That, you know, from the beginning of time, writers of literary nonfiction, of lyric essay, of personal essay, have been making up parts of their nonfiction. And, you know, I was just talking earlier before our talk with a former student of mine who was saying he's working on some essays and some of them are a little bit smudged. And my feeling is, you know, welcome to the Thunderdome, the Thunderdome or the Thunderdrome, as the case may be, that, um, that uh, the very nature of composition is that you are going to be making stuff up. Memory itself is a dream machine, and so that the whole idea that somehow nonfiction would have a kind of crystalline purity to it, a kind of chaste truth, is just preposterous. And there are so many examples from the history of literature. Thucydides is a dramatic one. Some other examples are um, Thomas de Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater is the book about his addiction to and recovery from opium and it, it it's one of the great works of 19th century English autobiography. He completely fictionalizes the recovery aspect of the opium that he didn't recover from the opium addiction until 30 years after he actually wrote the book. But in the book, he frames himself as having recovered from opium. Again, calling James Fry. Um, some other examples of that are Edmund Goss's book, Father and Son, which was written when Goss was 57 and recounts long stretches of, ver of verbatim dialogue, supposedly between father and son when Goss was age eight. And everyone in the Goss family, all their friends, all their acquaintances, all question as, as well they might have the veracity of these memories. And one last example is George Orwell's classic essay, Such Such Were the Joys, his account of a, a British, a brutal British boarding school that he attended. And almost every one of Orwell's classmates question virtually every detail of the essay. So again, the history of nonfiction is bound up with questions of veracity, of truth, of reality, of fabrication. And it's important for us to realize, I mean, I'm not saying that if, you're, if your biography of Thomas Jefferson should be full of fabrications or if you're writing uh, a book on woodworking that somehow you should make up where the screws and, and, and bolts go. But I am saying there's an ancient tradition going back millennia, certainly to Thucydides, in which literary nonfiction, literary essay, personal essay, or a term I heard today just simply calling serious nonfiction a consideration, that you're simply considering something, that, from the, from, that writers have always existed in this sort of limbo land in which things are neither exactly true nor entirely fictional, but are essentially meditations on a large subject. Um, I thought I'd bring us up today a little bit from Thucydides and <clears throat> talk a little bit how I got to this point that I was writing this book. And a few of you, I thought some of you have heard a version of this in an earlier discussion on campus today. So some of this might be a slight, slight repetition, but um, I began as a fiction writer, that my huge, huge rebellion against my journalist parents was that I was a writer, but a fiction writer. That was my staggering departure.